Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, up for grabs. Several key midterm races are still too early to call, with ballots still being counted and control of Congress still hanging in the balance. Well, the latest from all those close elections this morning and the impact their outcomes could have on both parties. Landfall. Nicole is churning across Florida this morning, quickly downgraded after making landfall as a Category 1 hurricane, but still lashing the region with heavy winds and rain. We're going to bring you a live report on the ground as the rare November storm moves inland and where it could be headed next. Bracing for inflation, the cost of living top of mind for most Americans. We're going to dig into the latest inflation report. Will we start to see prices on everyday items come down soon and what it all means for you and your wallet? And verified confusion. Twitter's new subscription service is creating controversy this morning with fake accounts now flocking to the platform. So we're going to try and sort out who is real and who isn't and what the social media company is doing to clear up any confusion. Last I checked, I think I'm real. There's just a lot going on in Twitter right now. So, right, we'll, yeah, we'll do our best yeah. to sort out the blue check mess. Yeah. So we're going to start this hour with the latest on the midterm election. And control of Congress remains up in the air this morning. Yeah, votes are still being counted in several key races. And it could be a while before we know which party will control the House and Senate. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haake has the latest. Leaders of both parties are projecting confidence this morning, despite so many uncalled races in so many states. Here on the Hill, there's a little bit of a sense of deja vu back to 2020, that things might all come down to Georgia and a runoff there once again to determine who controls the U.S. Senate. On Capitol Hill this morning, the balance of power in both chambers still up for grabs, with several key races too early or too close to call. President Biden calling Tuesday's midterms a good day for democracy. But despite polling showing many voters were dissatisfied with the economy and the direction of the country, the president, when asked if he'd do anything differently, responding, Nothing, because they're just finding out what we're doing. In the Senate, counts continue in two battleground states, Arizona and Nevada where election staffers are carefully sorting through thousands of remaining ballots. While in Georgia, incumbent Senator Raphael Warnock and former football star Herschel Walker are already asking voters to turn out for them once again in a runoff next month. Asked how he's feeling after a night when Republicans did not see the decisive victories they'd hoped for, Senate GOP leader Mitch McConnell had this to say. I don't deal in feelings. Uh, the question is, they've got to count the votes. And then we'll figure out where we are. Control of the House now rests with a smattering of seats where ballots are still being processed. Democrats did have some setbacks, particularly in New York, where Republicans campaigned heavily on crime issues and picked up a number of seats, even knocking off the House Democrats' campaign chair, the first time that's happened in over 40 years. What message do you think the American people were trying to send you? I don't think the American people have given up on democracy. Even without the final tally, top House Republican Kevin McCarthy setting his sights on the speaker's gap. Leader McCarthy, do you have the votes for both the majority and the speakership? Yes. As President Biden prepares for a possible divided government for the remainder of his term. I'm prepared to work with my Republican colleagues. The American people have made clear, I think, that they expect Republicans to be prepared to work with me as well. In that same news conference, President Biden saying once again that he intends to run for re-election, but doesn't feel any pressure to make an official announcement anytime soon, despite whatever Donald Trump may be planning to do. Asked by our colleague Kristen Welker whether exit polling that shows a majority of Americans would prefer he not run again influences decision, President Biden said simply, it doesn't. All right, Garrett, thank you so much. Republicans are now reconsidering just how much influence former President Trump should hold over the party following some disappointing midterm results for candidates he endorsed. It comes as Florida Governor Ron DeSantis hints at a possible run for president in 2024. NBC News Now anchor and senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson has more on the growing rift between the two. Hey there, Governor Ron DeSantis is getting a lot of credit for how well his party did in his state these midterms. But it is another Florida man seeking the spotlight instead, former President Trump, even as he's under fire from some in his party for what they see as his major midterm missteps. With Donald Trump this morning facing a disappointing performance from the candidates he backed in key battlegrounds and criticism from some Republicans, another GOP star now putting pressure on the former president. 
Mr. Trump, widely expected to announce another presidential run next week, may face a challenge from Florida's popular Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, who won his race in a re-election landslide. We not only won election, we have rewritten the political map. It comes as Mr. Trump is taking heat from some in his party for backing candidates, including election deniers, seen as too extreme for voters in key battlegrounds. In an interview before the midterm results, Mr. Trump straddling the fence. I think if they win, I should get all the credit, and if they lose, I should not be blamed at all. But that's not how some Republicans feel. This is a time that Donald Trump is no doubt in the rearview mirror. Retiring GOP Senator Pat Toomey telling the Philadelphia Inquirer election night was a terrible night for Donald Trump and an excellent night for Governor DeSantis, with the conservative New York Post dubbing DeSantis de future on Tuesday and this morning calling the former president Trumpy Dumpty, saying he had a big fall. Mr. Trump's own advisors are urging him to hold off on a presidential announcement ahead of the all-important Georgia runoff next month. I'm advising the president to hold off until after the Georgia race. And now the former president being called out by his former vice president, Mike Pence, for Mr. Trump's actions on January 6th. Pence in a Wall Street Journal op-ed ahead of his new book detailing the dramatic events of that day and criticizing Mr. Trump for encouraging election denials in the lead up to the violence. Pence, like DeSantis, may have his eye on the White House in the near future, but Mr. Trump seems to be more concerned about the Florida governor, posting on his social media site, shouldn't it be said that in 2020, I got 1.1 million more votes in Florida than Ron D. got this year? Just asking. To be clear, neither leader has officially declared a White House run, but Mr. Trump has been dropping hints repeatedly. DeSantis, for his part, releasing this ad tweeted by his wife, Casey, with an explicitly religious message aimed at a national audience. And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a protector. So God made a fighter. Whoever wins the GOP presidential primary would likely go up against President Biden. Our Kristen Welker asking him about a possible Trump-DeSantis showdown. It'll be fun watching them take on each other. And it looks like that is where this is headed, right? Mr. Trump overnight is trying to deflect some of the blame he's getting by basically pointing to the scoreboard, looking to the many candidates he endorsed who did win, many of them, though, in solidly red states or districts. But this whole thing is creating a conversation over the future direction of the Republican Party. One GOP donor telling me, hey, we got to get off the Trump train. That's the sentiment from some folks. Others feel differently. This is what the party needs to figure out moving forward and will be figuring out uh, as we look ahead to 2024. Back to you. All right, Hallie Jackson, thank you so much. Now to this morning's other big story, Nicole. The storm slammed into Florida's east coast earlier this morning as a Category 1 hurricane, packing 75-mile-an-hour winds. Yeah, the large storm is bringing heavy rain, damaging winds, and dangerous storm surges to the state, which is still recovering, of course, from Hurricane Ian. We have full coverage this morning. Michelle Grossman is following the storm's path. We'll check in with her in just a minute. But first, let's get to NBC News senior national correspondent Kerry Sanders for the latest there in Florida. Obviously, we could see it's looking pretty rough where he is. Hey, Kerry, good morning. Yeah, we're looking at the storm surge, guys, right now. This is a road that leads right down out onto the beach. Uh, this is one of those rare beaches here at Daytona Beach Shores where you can drive out on the beach and go up and down. Of course, the beach itself is underwater and you can see the power of the surf coming in. We have a rising tide here, so it has undermined much of this roadway here and the will get even worse here for the, about the next hour or so because of that rising tide. But the waves are tremendous. The wind speeds, well, as you noted, they were at least 75 miles an hour. But out at NASA, not too far from here, with the Artemis rocket on the launch pad, they clocked a wind gust of 100 miles an hour. So the engineers are going to have to triple check everything on that before what they hope is going to be a launch on November 16th. This morning, Nicole roaring ashore as a hurricane, lashing Florida's already battered east coast. Waves crashing onto the boardwalk in Daytona Beach. In Vero Beach, winds blowing up transformers. Now, a tropical storm, Nicole crawling its way through Florida and later will head up the east coast. Early winds and waves combined to wash away significant portions of the beach in Volusia County buildings left precariously close to the water's edge. There is an imminent danger 
of building collapse. Why? The storm surge from Hurricane Ian six weeks ago battered the sand dunes here, the last line of defense between the ocean and the coast. Absent those sand dunes, which are a natural protection, you can see the beach erosion. The seawall has already given way and it's given out. The next high tide will take out even more here. And as I take you over, see here, that building up there? Well, as you look down, you can see the erosion has already begun to undermine the foundation. Engineers say last-ditch efforts to shore up weakened areas will likely be little match for the power of the ocean, supercharged by Nicole. Look over your shoulder right now. Look at this. It's sickening. It's sickening. I'm, I'm in disbelief. Nicole Hubener owns a beach rental business. This is what it usually looks like here. Nicole is the nail in the coffin for Daytona Beach Shores. Ian came in and did all this damage. And now Nicole is just putting us away. Along more than 200 miles of the Atlantic coast, Florida emergency managers ordered mandatory evacuations and open shelters, but not everyone was willing to leave. It is late in the year. Um, we're Floridians, though. We're going to make it through it, and uh, we'll, we'll be here tomorrow. And I hope everybody stays safe. We're getting reports from those who are out looking, uh, producers examining some of the damage along the coast here in Daytona Beach Shores, and uh, there's at least one house that's halfway in the water. Uh, there are other seawalls that are gone. It's estimated in the region there's about 170,000 people who have lost power. I'm going to step back here because this stuff keeps blowing up. Uh, guys, as it's tropical storm and makes its way here on shore. It's also going to be causing some inland flooding in the Orlando area where wind gusts have been clocked at 50 miles an hour. And then it, well, I'll leave it to the forecasters to tell us where it's going. But anybody in the path needs to recognize it is enough of powerful winds to bring down tree branches and uh, cause some serious damage, especially as we're seeing right here along the coast, guys. Absolutely. Carrie, also on those mandatory evacuation orders, is there any idea how many people are staying in emergency shelters in the area? You know, it's so hard to do a calculation of who stayed and who went to emergency yeah. shelters. We know that some of the shelters filled up. We also mm. know that right here, some of the buildings here uh, are so precarious. I mean, where I'm standing right here, there's a building right there over there. And the camera on the other side, there's a building, there's swimming pools, and we know if the foundations give way. Look at that. There's come. Look at that. Wow. Definitely a rising tide. We know that those buildings could collapse, and so the authorities actually went into the buildings and said, "People, you need to leave." And they forced more than 200 people who said they were going to stay out of those various buildings. All right, Carrie Sanders, please stay safe. Thank you so much for being there for us. Sure. And let's get the latest on Nicole and where it is headed. Yeah, that means Michelle Grossman's back with us. Hey, Michelle, wow, it looks pretty bad there. It does. Hi there, guys. Well, it's a combination of a couple of things. We, of course, have Tropical Storm Nicole, which is causing those rough seas. We also have an area of high pressure to the north. So it's this area of low pressure, high pressure working together that's creating a squeeze play. And that's why we're seeing that coastal flooding. We've actually been seeing it for a couple of days before even Nicole arrived. And then on top of that, we have above normal high tide. So we're in that high tide cycle right now. We're going to see it for the next hour or so. And then hopefully things will continue to improve after that as we go throughout the day. Another good piece of news is it's a fast-moving storm, so it will be move out of, moving out of here pretty quickly, but we still have some time to get through. So that's for today. The Nicole wind, rain and wind throughout the southeast, uh, northern and central Florida today, Georgia, South Carolina. Then it's going to move up the coast tomorrow. Notice New England, northeast, the Ohio Valley, the mid-Atlantic today. Really nice. Nice temperatures. Enjoy it because things are going to change drastically tomorrow. I do want to get to those uh, northern plains and northern high plains because we're looking at blizzard conditions in that area. We could 18 inches of snow. So we're talking tropics, we're talking really warm temperatures, and then we're just talking frigid temperatures with a winter snowstorm back through the west. So let's first start with Nicole because that is what we are watching right now. As we go throughout time here, we're going to continue to watch Nicole move across the Florida Peninsula. It's going to continue to bring very heavy rain, very gusty winds, creating more power outages every single half hour. It seems like the numbers go up. And we're going to see that soaking rain continuing throughout Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Then it will make a second land 
landfall across the Panhandle of Florida. That will be later on this evening. And then it will make a right hand turn. It's going to move quickly. So as we go throughout tomorrow, it's going to be a nasty day. I do want to warn you of that. So enjoy today in the Northeast because look at tomorrow. Gusty winds, drenching rains, soaking rains, even as far west as the Ohio Valley, at least portions of the Ohio Valley. The Appalachians, you are going to get a ton of rain as well as the higher elevations that we're particularly concerned about. And this extends into New England. This will be tomorrow and then it races off the coast early on Saturday morning and Nicole is out of here and we will not be speaking of her any longer, but we still do have the next 48 hours to get through. That is Nicole. And then as we're looking at the rainfall, we could see up to eight inches of rain in some spots. That's certainly going to cause some flash flooding in spots. We're seeing ponding on the roads already. We're seeing uh, that delicate, the delicate structures of beach erosion, and we're going to continue to see that as well. Now, as we, as we move through the coast on Friday and Saturday, you can see pockets of heavy rain. Where you see those darker colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, that's the Appalachians, and that's why we're concerned about that higher elevation rainfall. We could see certainly see some flash flooding there. Storm surge, that is always a concern with uh, hurricanes, tropical systems. We're looking at three to five feet storm surge. So if you picture yourself, you're five feet tall, you could have that ocean water go to your head. So this is why we have evacuation zones. This is why you cannot be there and you need to move away from those evacuation zones because it's ocean water moving over dry land. And that includes the west coast of Florida as well into the big bend of Florida. So that will be today as we go throughout the rest of your Thursday major beach erosion during high tides. That is happening right now. Also looking at a tornado risk. Uh, we're looking from Wilmington to Charleston, Savannah, Jacksonville, and this threat will move uh, to the northeast as we head towards tomorrow. So now the mid-Atlantic, you're in on that too. A few possible tornadoes from Richmond, Raleigh, Cape Hatteras, Wilmington, Charlotte. And we're looking at those record highs as well in the north. So we're looking at really warm air. We have that cold air to the west. We have the jet stream right in the middle. This is going to move to the east. It's going to bring the chance for severe weather in portions of uh, the upper Midwest, also the Great Lakes. But we are looking at winter alerts through the northern plains, even a blizzard warning, you guys, through the uh, wow. high plains today. Back to you. No longer 70 degree temperatures mm, there. Yeah, All right, Michelle, yeah. thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. Turning to some major tech news, Facebook's parent company, Meta, is blaming a slowing economy for those massive job cuts that were announced yesterday. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has more on this for us. Tom, good morning. Hey, Joe, yeah, the slowing economy is a big reason why tech companies are laying off across the board. As you mentioned, now the giant on the tech universe, Facebook parent company Meta, is sending pink slips to a big chunk of its workforce. Mark Zuckerberg's vision for a bright, colorful future filled with virtual reality may have to wait. After the CEO of Facebook parent company Meta announced big cuts, 13% of the workforce, 11,000 employees laid off. I want to say, you know, up front, uh, that I take full responsibility for this decision. A contrite Zuckerberg appeared on video to the staff, recorded by an employee impacted by the layoffs. It was, you know, one of the hardest calls that I've, I've had to make in, in, in the 18 years of running the company. As you'd expect, Meta employees took to social media. Just woke up to news that Meta has laid off 13% of employees, myself included, wrote one. Another said it was a dream role, dream team, dream manager, dream everything. Zuckerberg says Meta needs to become a leaner and more efficient company. He spent billions of dollars on his virtual reality vision of the future called the Metaverse. A surgeon will be able to practice as many times as needed in the Metaverse before laying her hands on a real patient. But investors complain he spent far too much on the concept. Facebook had been seen as the Silicon Valley tech darling. But Meta stock has dropped 70% this year alone. Third quarter earnings down 50%. Facebook was spending like 1980s rock stars. And now growth has really come off significantly. The metaverse strategy continues to be an uphill battle. The world has viewed Zuckerberg as something of, of a savant and a business genius, but he admits he got this wrong. This is Mark Zuckerberg saying we grew too fast. We assumed that the boom times would continue. And they, they haven't. No, this is a really tough time right now for any ad-supported platform. Meta's revenues have also been squeezed by changes to Apple's iPhone operating systems that make it harder to target ads to individuals. And advertisers have pulled back as the economy has slowed. But Meta Facebook isn't the only tech company that's laying off employees. Twitter, Salesforce, Netflix, Snap and Apple have as well. 
Amazon and Apple have also frozen hiring. The question now, is the metaverse on hold? The metaverse may be virtual, but the impact will be real. Well, importantly here, Mark Zuckerberg, despite the fact that the stock is down 70%, the company's struggling, he is virtually untouchable as CEO. He founded Facebook almost 20 years ago, but he structured the company and the stock issuance in such a way that it essentially ensures total control for him. And by the way, with Meta stock down, it's now worth less than Home Depot and Apple is now eight times more valuable than Meta, you guys. Wow. All right, yeah, Tom, wow. thank you so much. Right. Coming up on Morning News Now, the latest on an alarming surge in cases of respiratory virus. Children's hospitals are nearing capacity in many areas. We're going to show you what one city is doing to try and protect those kids. That's next. We're back with more on the growing concerns surrounding the triple demic, RSV, COVID, and the flu. Experts have predicted that heading into winter, the combination of those viruses is going to overwhelm pediatric hospitals that are already being hit hard with cases of the respiratory virus. In St. Louis, they're opening a free drive through to test for those viruses. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us now from there. Maggie, good morning to you. So walk us through the process of what this drive through testing looks like. I know I'm having flashbacks to 2020. And tell us, do you need an appointment? for this one. Right. Yeah, well, to your point, it's going to look a lot like 2020. So first question there, it's a great one. No, you do not need an appointment. You can come to sites like this South County Health Center here in St. Louis, other sites listed on the state's Department of Health website. You can drive up, get a single nasal swab, a lot like what we saw during peak pandemic. And that single swab will test for all at once the flu, covid and RSV, so kind of the trifecta behind this so-called triple-demic that so many experts are afraid of. And it's worth noting, anyone of any age can get tested. But of course, Joe, given this surge of RSV, kids are definitely top of mind. All right, so you are in St. Louis in Kentucky. Dozens of school districts have closed for days on end because of RSV, the flu, strep throat, other illnesses. I know you spoke to a superintendent from one of those counties. What are some of the challenges they're facing right now? Definitely. I talked to the superintendent of Powell County, Kentucky, uh, just a couple thousand students in that district, and they had been closed, in her words, for a solid week, only having reopened yesterday after sending everybody home. They didn't even do classes online. They just said everybody was so sick and they were dealing with so much illness that it wouldn't have been worth it to try and go remote. They normally have attendance just around or just below 90 percent. Listen to what she said about how bad numbers got. It was all of our students across the board. We had at one elementary school got down to 65% attendance, and the but district wide we were at 74. So uh, it was across the board. So again, Joe, as you said, that's just one district, dozens across the state of Kentucky, which is a particularly hard hit state with RSV. They have had to close down. We heard 26 districts at its peak, more than 100,000 students impacted. And that's just this month, Joe. So Maggie, as we've been reporting, RSV is putting a strain on hospital systems. This is not a new illness, uh, yet it's, you know, it's common for children to come down with RSV every year. It seems this year we're getting hit earlier, we're getting hit harder. Why is that? Right, definitely. And I talked to a doctor about this because, you know, we talk about COVID, but that was a novel virus. And to your point, RSV is not new. This comes around every year, but this is a really severe year. Pediatric hospitals with severe cases that warrant being hospitalized, they're being overrun. And so when we asked why, doctors say there are a couple of reasons or a few reasons that seem to be combining. Number one, RSV can have particularly bad seasons. That's happened before. But there's also another one that's really um, sort of poignant given the timing that doctors are highlighting. Take a listen. Part of the reason we're getting hit so early is because the last two years, people have been isolated to the point where they really haven't been affected, especially children by RSV. And so now instead of the normal pool of children that could be susceptible to it, that pool has essentially doubled. And there are many more children who haven't had it are able to get it right now and get it in the serious conditions that's causing that pressure on the hospitals. And just to kind of drive this home, once again, RSV comes around every year and we just, you know, we all saw kind of the impacts of COVID and everybody still has that fresh in their minds. But I asked one pediatrician out in California where they're on the brink of running out of beds. And I said, you know, specific to pediatric beds, because kids weren't hit that hard by COVID. I said, can you ever remember a time where you were on the brink of running out 
of pediatric hospital beds, hospital beds for kids. She thought about it, and she said, no, I can't. This is really jarring. Wow, that speaks Jones, volumes. Back to you. All right, Maggie, thank you so much. Now to stunning new developments in the war in Ukraine. Yesterday, Russia announced its forces would withdraw from the southern city of Kherson and the surrounding area. Kherson was the only regional capital Moscow had secured since invading Ukraine. Here's President Biden reacting to the news yesterday. It's evidence of the fact that they have some real problems, Russian, the Russian military, um, number one. Number two, whether or not that leads to, at a minimum, it will lead to uh, time for everyone to re recalibrate their positions over the winter period. And it remains to be seen whether or not there will be a judgment made um, as to uh, um, whether or not Ukraine is prepared to uh, compromise with Russia. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter joins us now from Kiev. Hey, Molly, good to see you. So walk us through this announcement by Russian officials. Why did they say they're doing this? Just how much of a setback is it? Yeah, Savannah, and Russian officials have been signaling this for the last couple of weeks. They have been moving uh, civilians, tens of thousands of civilians, out of the area. They've been calling it safe evacuations. Kiev has been calling it forced deportations. But yesterday, the Russian defense minister got on TV and said they are evacuating, they are retreating all of their military forces to the east bank of the Dnipro River. Now, the Dnipro River cuts that Kherson southern region in half. As we've talked about, Savannah, that whole region uh, is extremely strategic for Russia. It provides a land bridge from occupied Crimea, really around the southeast to mainland Russia. Now, that river right now is no man's land. Russia, excuse me, uh, has seen uh, big blows like this before. Over the summer, they pulled back and the Ukrainian forces pushed them back from the eastern city of Kharkiv. And of course, we remember in March and April when Ukrainian forces were able to push them out from around the capital. Mm. But this would be huge if it happens. And Molly, what's the reaction been like from Ukrainian officials? A lot of skepticism. So I think this is where kind of in the next couple of days we will see what is actually happening. Now, Ukraine's military says this morning, Savannah, that the Ukrainian military is really pushing towards the city. They have recaptured 12 settlements in the south. What they say they don't know, though, is how fast Russia is actually retreating, how many of those 40,000 uh, soldiers that Moscow sent into Kherson have actually left, and really, have they left any kind of uh, reserves in this city? Now, I just want to show you a couple of tweets from presidential advisor Mikhail Poldelak, who tweeted out, actions speak louder than words. We see no signs that Russia is leaving Kherson without a fight. He then continued this morning. He said Russian forces want to turn Kherson into a city of death. He continued to say this is what the Russian world looks like. They came, robbed, celebrated, killed witnesses, and left in ruins. Now, the Ukrainian Operational Command of the South Savannah, the military operation down near Kherson, says right now there is a military operation underway, which requires an information blackout. So what's actually happening in that area, we may not know for a couple of days. Oh, wow. Molly, also, I want to ask you about some exclusive reporting by NBC News. Could potentially be some good news here. Western officials see this coming winter as a possible window for diplomacy. Is anything being done behind the scenes to push this? And also, obviously, this retreat is big news. Could this provide an opportunity for negotiations? Right. Clearly, there are a lot of back-channel discussions, uh, Savannah, that we may not be aware of. But I do want to uh, highlight Courtney Cuby, Carol Lee, and Josh Letterman, our colleagues in Washington, mm -hmm. their reporting, which says that some U.S. and Western officials increasingly believe that neither side can achieve all of their goals in uh, the Ukraine war this winter. And they talk about this slowdown of fighting as a possible window for diplomacy. One official with direct knowledge of military operations who spoke on anonymity told our colleague Savannah, in the winter, everything slowed down the potential for talks we would like to see that happening now u.s officials have repeatedly said publicly that they are not back channeling and talking to russia about ukraine without ukraine the u.s u.n ambassador linda thomas greenfield was actually in kiev earlier this week a very high level visit i asked her what kind of pressure they're putting on ukrainian officials to get to the table and she said that is absolutely ukraine's decision which is what they'll continue to say but we'll be watching closely all right molly hunter stay safe thank you very much Staying with the midterm, supporters of abortion rights were among the biggest winners in this year's vote. Several blue and red states voted against measures that would have restricted access to abortions. NBC News Washington correspondent Yamiche Alcindor has more. 
Democrats across the country are celebrating sweeping wins for supporters of abortion rights. A woman's right to choose one. I will always, always keep fighting to protect a woman's fundamental freedom. We will make Michigan a leader, a place where women make their own decisions. In Michigan, residents voted to enshrine abortion rights into the state constitution. An issue Governor Gretchen Whitmer and her running mate made a central part of their successful re-election campaign. This is a right that we are not going to go backwards on. I'm proud of my state. I don't want the government in my bedroom. And abortion rights did drive people to the polls. It was the second most important issue to voters behind inflation. In addition to Michigan, voters in California and Vermont codified abortion rights into their state constitutions. And it wasn't just blue states. Voters in Kentucky and Montana shot down measures that could have restricted access. What do you make of that nationally? I think it's, it's a sign that the American public has had rights for 49 years and we're not going to go backward. And so whether it's state by state we see this happen or hopefully at some point, uh, you know, a national effort again, um, I think that this is where the, the fight is at the moment. Those against abortion rights now processing the results. I believe abortion is first degree murder. Eric Scheidler from the Pro-Life Action League says he's gearing up to continue their push. If we've learned anything over the past 50 years, um, as a movement, it's that we've got to be able to take a punch. Still, Americans in five states sent a clear message about reproductive rights. Yami Sendor, NBC News, Detroit. Coming up, the latest readout on inflation is out. Yeah, we're going to break down the numbers and what it means for you and your bottom line. Stick with us. We got that when we come back. We are back now with some breaking economic data. Yeah, that's right. The October inflation report has just been released. It shows inflation rose by 7.7% on the year and 0.4% on the month. Here to walk us through these numbers, we're joined by NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung. Also, the editor-in-chief of Investopedia, Caleb Silver, is with us. Thank you both for being here. And Brian, I will start with you and this data. Break down these numbers for us. How do they compare with what we saw last month? Yes, yeah, Savannah, we got a little bit of good news on the inflation front. The number for uh, how much prices grew in the month of October, 7.7%. That was lower, by the, by the way, than the street's estimates of about 7.9%, and also a slower pace than we saw in the month of September, where it was 8.2%, and also recall earlier in the year, it was pacing at about 9.1%. So you're starting to see that number come down a little bit, although we are still far away from about the 2% target that the nation's yeah. central bank, the Federal Reserve, would like to see it. So prices still rising at a rapid pace, but albeit a little bit slower than we've seen earlier this year. Caleb, let's bring you in here. What's your reaction to these numbers? Any surprises here? Well, better than expected, but we're still seeing the inflation in the places where it hurts the most. That's food, that's energy, and that's shelter. The uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics noting that shelter making up about half of the increase, so rent prices keep increasing. They're starting to ease a little bit in areas around the Northeast, but still the things that we spend on every single week, every single month are very expensive for consumers, but it's nice to see that rate come down. And by the way, this is the lowest rate all, all since January, so the biggest decrease since January. Mm -hmm. It may show that those interest rates are starting to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be a little bit of good news. Uh, let's dig in more specifically on those particular breakouts that you just mentioned. Caleb, Brian, tell us about what numbers we are seeing in category shelter, food, gasoline. Yeah, well, these are the three biz biggest expenditures for American households. And what we're looking at here is the monthly change. So this is the difference between August and September shelter at that time. Again, this is rent and also the equivalent payments for your mortgages up 0.7 percentage points. Not good news this month as that actually increased to 0.8 percent uh, between September and October. Food, though, the pace of price increase is getting a a little bit slower, up 0.6%. And then I also want to add here, as you, hopefully you can read my handwriting here, gasoline uh, went down between August and September, down 4.9%. That trend actually reversing as gasoline went up about 4% between uh, September and October. That lines up with the fact that average gas of gallon, uh, average price of a, ga a gallon of gas went up from about 380 to $3.92 during that period. So shelter, just the cost of rent remaining a very, very high price pressure. Caleb, you mentioned interest rates. Probably no one's paying closer attention to these numbers right now than the Fed. So what do you think the Fed's going to do when they see these numbers? Say, hey, we're on the right path. This is working. Are they going to change things moving forward? 
Well, this is, uh, you, if you look at the reaction in the stock market, investors are probably betting that the Fed is going to cool it a little bit on the next interest rate hike. That next meeting is happening in December. The banking right now, the thinking is that it'll be another, it'll be a half a percent increase, not another three quarter percent increase. This may slow their role even a little bit more and into 2023. Mm -hmm. So the stock market reacting saying, hey, the Fed's uh, uh, maybe may cool it a little bit here. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, absolutely. I, well, let's kind of talk a little bit more about that and try to explain it in some simple terms here. So inflation staying persistently high, Brian, but, you know, as Caleb just mentioned, maybe these are some signs that these interest rate hikes are working. Is that something that a consumer at home can take away? Maybe say, hey, that'll lay off eventually soon? Well, it might be working from the perspective that you're not seeing those inflation rates continue to rise. Yeah. But look, this is a chart of the year over year rates that we've seen over the last year. And you can see it's not really going down. It's kind of going sideways. That's 7.7% figure if I try to connect the dots here roughly around there. So this is not the downward decline, the sharp decline that Americans would like to see. So at the store, you're not observing the impact of those interest rate hikes. But remember, economists have said once they start to do these interest rate hikes, it could take as long as six to nine months to actually feel the impact of that, meaning that the Fed began this journey in March of this year. We might not start to see the impact of that until right about now. So maybe we'll start to see that come down, hopefully in the next few months, but at least markets and perhaps other Fed analysts and inflation watchers around the, uh, the country, hopefully taking a little bit of solace that the number yeah. went down as opposed to going up. Yeah. Caleb, we're just coming out of the midterms. We know inflation is a top issue among voters. That being said, the Fed is, Fed is independent from the government and sometimes it's unclear what Congress can actually do to control inflation. What do you expect Congress to do, if anything, moving forward to try and help this process along? Yeah, not a lot that they can do. We may see some more policies trying to be pushed out by the Biden administration, but we may have that gridlock that we spoke about yesterday. That could prevent any new measure, so they can't do much about it, although you're going to hear a lot of politicians talking about how it's finally easing uh, as of the last report. Remember, this is all rear view mirror. At mm -hmm. the same time, uh, to Brian's point, we're going to be up here for a while. It's not like we go right back down the hill and the Fed starts cutting rates. This is the new normal. All right, Brian Chung and Caleb Silver breaking down this breaking news. Thank you both. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Big news. All right, let's stay on financial headlines. We've seen big layoffs in the tech industry. Now City and Barclays are also announcing major layoffs. CNBC's Savannah Hanau joins us with that and more money news. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe, Savannah. Yeah, well, Wall Street layoffs are starting to pick up as banks are grappling with a downturn in revenue. Reports say Citigroup let go about 50 trading employees this week and dozens of banking roles amid a slump in deal making. Sources say Barclays has cut about 200 people across its banking and trading desk. The moves show the industry is returning to the practice of cutting workers who are underperformers. Taiwan Semiconductor has major expen expansion plans for the Grand Canyon State, the world's largest contract chip maker and a key supplier for Apple, announcing yesterday it's, con it's constructing a building in Arizona that could serve as its second U.S. chip factory. Taiwan Semi telling Reuters it hasn't made a final decision on the plant, but says it could use the new building for future expansion based on strong customer demand. The Biden administration has been encouraging foreign tech firms to manufacture products in the U.S. and is actively supporting local research and development. Colorado is now the latest state where drivers can add their license or ID to Apple Wallet. They must have iOS 15 or later on their iPhone, and people can use their digital ID at certain TSA checkpoints at Denver International Airport. The ID includes the person's legal name, date of birth, photo, and real ID status. Arizona, Connecticut, Georgia, Iowa, Kentucky, Maryland, Oklahoma, and Utah also support digital IDs inside the Apple Wallet, guys. A few yeah. years from now, kids won't even know what a real wallet is. Right. So story. I mean, yeah. it, is, it is nice to have one less thing in your bag. There you oh, go. It is. Back, I back. pay with Apple Pay just in my, yes. you know, in my wallet there all the time. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. Yeah. Coming up on Morning News Now, fake account fever. The rush to get that blue check on Twitter is creating a surge of verified parody accounts. So who's real and who's fake? We will break that down next. Welcome back this morning. The confusion over the verified blue check marks on Twitter is continuing on the platform. Yeah, not long after CEO Elon Musk rolled out a new paid subscription that allows users to buy a blue check, some users began to abuse the service and impersonate athletes, brands, celebrities, even Musk himself. Days before the rollout, Twitter's new owner said he would suspend users who impersonate others if the account was not clearly marked as parody. 
Yeah, so for more, we're joined by NBC News youth and internet culture reporter Callan Rosenblatt. Callan, great to have you with us on this. It's an interesting one for sure. I mean, it took less than 24 hours for users actually to start abusing this new Twitter subscription plan for that blue check. Tell us what kind of impersonations we're seeing, what type of content they're putting out. Good morning, Joe and Savannah. The first kinds of impersonations we saw started with athletes. We saw Connor McDavid, who is an NHL player, LeBron James, uh, obviously a very famous NBA player on the Lakers, announcing that they were uh, you know, requesting trades or had been traded, which would be obviously enormous news. But of course, it was fake. It was from these very realistic looking fake accounts that had purchased verified badges. Later, we saw companies like Nintendo of America, who appeared to be um, you know, posting vulgar images, uh, again, a fake account. Later, we even saw people like Rudy Giuliani making, uh, you know, very inflammatory statements. Again, that was a fake account. So we're continuing to see these accounts pop up. All the accounts I've mentioned have been banned and suspended, but it's a game of whack-a-mole that Twitter is now playing with these verified accounts that are, uh, you know, purporting to be real people, real brands, real entities when they're not. You know, so before Musk bought Twitter, it had rules about impersonation and parody accounts. How's the website responding now? So now it's kind of like a blanket ban if you are impersonating someone and, you know, the t Twitter's very um, diminished moderation team catches you. Previously, it could be a strike on your account. Um, if you made it clear that you were a parody, typically it was fine and you could keep your account up. But the difference between then and now is that you couldn't have a verified check mark. You couldn't just purchase a verified check mark. Of course, we did see accounts that uh, were previously verified and then changed their display name and their images and pretended to be someone. They usually got a temporary ban and then were reinstated. If they repeated the action, then they were permanently banned. But prior to Twitter Blue rolling out with uh, the verification badges, you couldn't just buy a verification badge and look realistic. So mm -hmm. this is going to be really difficult in, in the age of misinformation and disinformation. It's going to be really challenging to suss out who is a real entity and who isn't. Callan, let's like just zoom out and talk to us about sort of everything going on at Twitter. I mean, there's been so much news since Musk has taken over from the day he walked in carrying a sink to the layoffs to obviously this whole blue check plan. I mean, just walk us through what all this means for Twitter's future. Uh, Savannah, I mean, I think it really, this speaks to like brand safety at Twitter. If Twitter is mm. making a, a, most of its revenue off of advertisers or a significant portion off of advertisers, having these, you know, Twitter blue verified accounts, like let's look at the Nintendo of America account. I could see Nintendo having a real difficult time justifying advertising on Twitter when it can't have, uh, you know, it, it's more difficult to determine what is the real Nintendo when there are these fake accounts popping up. It's just going to be really difficult in the future for brands to trust this entity, and it's going to be hard for it to make money. All right, Callan Rosenblatt, thank you so much. And we've got much more coming up. Yeah, stick around. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. This is very sweet. November is Adopt a Senior Pet Month, and we have good news for 23 very good boys and girls, which we're going to make Joe say in just a minute. Many of these animals were picked up as strays. Look at this. But now... They were flown from L.A. to Eugene, Oregon, where they were welcomed warmly into new foster and forever homes. The flight was funded by the Gray Muzzle Organization and celebrated the charity Pet Rescue Pilots, which delivers pets from overcrowded shelters to their new homes. Now, all dogs on the flight were seven years old or older. Let's hope they all have happy endings. This is bad news for my husband because I'm definitely about to come home and be like, November, we have to adopt a senior. It's good for the world. Um, all They're right. all good girls. They're all good girls and good boys. All right. Good Thanks, to Joe. see that. Those, those flight operations, too. All right. You might know Seth Rogen as the leading man in comedies like Knocked Up, The 40-Year-Old Virgin, and Pineapple Express. But he's taking on an emotional new role for Steven Spielberg's new film, The Fablements, based on the director's own childhood. Join the Today Show for more. Take a listen. Kind of crazy was it for you? You're going about your life uh -huh. and you get a call from Steven Spielberg. So initially, what did you think that that call was about? Um, I had no idea. I thought maybe I was in trouble. I thought I was going to yell. I've made a lot of jokes in my career that are uh, very, uh, you know, insulting to many people. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, he, I actually knew him. I thought maybe he was about writing something. I, I've yeah. written, uh, you know, I'd met him about writing things in the past. But yeah, he expressed that um, he had written a 
film with Tony Kushner mm -hmm. and that there was a role in it that they were interested in me playing. Um, and he was like, read it and then tell me if you want to do it. And I was like, I'll want to do it. I guess I don't <laughs> yeah. need to read it. But he was like, just read it. And um, yeah, and I read it and uh, and I loved it and it was amazing. No one else was cast in the film. I think I was the first one cast. He, he which, said it was you. He that's a weird you. way. Yeah, yeah. As you know, I guess the best directors start with the fourth lead. <laughs> that's how that's how to do it. So you <laughs> you play like kind of almost like the uncle of Steven Spielberg, sort of, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah I play as uh, in, in real life. It was yeah. a guy named Uncle Bernie in my yeah. character is called Uncle Benny, which is yeah. uh, uh, shows kind of how close to life the film is at times. And yeah, Uncle Benny and Bernie played a very unique role in his life. There's kind of some surprises and twists and turns that my yeah. character is involved in that I don't want to uh, fully reveal. But um, it's uh, but he was also someone who's very impactful to Stephen and and someone that. Um, everyone in his family was very fond of uh, throughout uh, uh -huh. their entire lives. And so capturing this person that they all have this affection for who kind of was known as this like gregarious, lovable character in their yeah. lives was, yeah, something you feel a lot of pressure to do well, when it's Steven Spielberg. <laughs> no kidding. And there was also a lot of pain that Steven Spielberg said he was living through during this, so much so that some described him on the set as like getting emotional. What, what was it like for him from what you saw? It did seem like a cathartic experience at times. Yeah. It did feel like there were moments where we would be filming things, and as we were filming it, he was kind of in real time gaining a new perspective wow. on his own life. Wow. Um, and at times, it almost seems like we would adjust the scenes based on this huh. profound new perspective that he seemed to be gaining in, in, in real time at times, yeah. um, which was an amazing journey to go on, especially with someone that... I've looked up to my whole yeah. life creatively. It's one of the reasons I make movies, you know? And so, yeah, to in any way get to facilitate anything mm -hmm. that yeah. they feel is additive to their life, uh, like for that person is like, it's like a rare gift, you what, know? What kind of an impact has Steven Spielberg had on your life? Well, I think like in a larger sense, like what we culturally understand as like blockbuster cinematic yeah. films are purely based on his taste, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Like, and I think the movie captures that in an interesting way, where it's like the things that we associate with scope, yeah. epicness, yeah. again, uh, blockbuster filmmaking is, is almost entirely stuff he popularized yeah. because he personally liked it. Can't wait. The Fablements has a limited release in New York and L.A. tomorrow before the wider release on November 23rd. Not exciting. All right, we have some breaking news this morning. The famed Rockefeller Center tree has just been cut down. There it is in a few hours. It'll be right here. Just It'll be a 30 rock backyard. Saturday morning. Can't yeah. wait. Saturday morning. Look there out for go. the tree. That does it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.